Well, please open your Bibles. Open your Bibles, please, to Hebrews chapter 3. All right, I know uh, I've done this before. It was a different year, though, okay? I'm going to put up my fourth grade class picture. Can you believe this? Classic 1973 look. If, if you had these uh, pictures when you were a kid, uh, or these uh, school pictures, notice how they don't put any names on there? That's to protect the guilty of fashion crimes. <clears throat> Did you see me? Do you know which one's me? Bottom middle. Oh, my goodness. This was uh, in Barrington, Illinois. Some of you are Chicagoans, so you know, just outside Chicago. It was a great season. I rode my bike to school uh, from there. And uh, every day, first thing we did when we got to school, uh, same thing we did every day as an entire school. Okay, you remember, we would stand at our desks, we would face the flag, and we would recite what? The Pledge of Allegiance, right? I pledge allegiance to that flag of the United States of America. We won't say the same thing. Do you guys forget it? No, I'm sure you didn't. It's been instilled into us. Well, this pledge, okay, that we grew up saying in school every single day, is a kind of confession. It's a kind of creed. And as Americans, okay, these are things that we mutually agree on to defend and to uphold. These are common commitments to some vital principles and values and beliefs, like one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can you believe that we all recited that every single day? Well, my, my son and I, we did uh, Boy Scouts together. And before every meeting, uh, we would recite another confession. Okay, in some ways, another creed, and it was called the Scout Oath. Anybody else was a scout or a scout master? Okay, we got a few. So you may remember this. Okay, raise your hand here. On my honor, I will do my best to do my duty to God and my country and to obey the scout law, to help other people at all times, to keep myself physically strong, mentally awake, and morally straight. Pretty powerful, isn't it? Now, we don't do this in our church, but, but I grew up, like many of you, in churches where we recited creeds. It was a regular part of our worship, the Nicene Creed, the Apostles' Creed, and these creeds or these confessions of faith were especially a very important part of the early church. Uh, they included the primary beliefs that were critical to the faith. They helped to clarify beliefs that combated heresy or error, which was, was very common. And over time, uh, the repetition of creeds, it has pros and cons, all right? They, they can become a ritual that numbs, numbs our minds to the actual content of the creed. Uh, what, what's the saying? Familiarity breeds contempt. Taking it for granted could lead to boredom, you know? But these creeds can be a powerful reminder an anchor that keeps us aligned with truth in a world that's always changing. So we're going to actually read the Apostles' Creed together this morning. We, did, we don't have a firm date for this, okay? It's been modified over the years, but the church began using it around 400 A.D., so 1,600 plus years ago. I'd like us to recite it together, and as we do this, let's not have contempt or boredom. Let's be asking ourselves do I believe this today, okay? Now, I don't know if we need to do this, but can we stand and we'll recite the Apostles' Creed together? Thank you. All right, we got it in two parts here. You ready? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. 
On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may have a seat. And notice Catholic is small c, okay? So if you haven't said that in a while, that, that's the universal church is what that means. It's not talking about the Roman Catholic Church. I know it's hard for some of you to get those words out, but we do. We believe in the holy universal church in all times and all places. That's what that means. Does that bring back some memories for some of you? It does for me. But memories don't count for much today when it comes to a confession of faith. You may have a certificate of completion for a catechism or a baptism or confirmation in eighth grade. That's great. But what matters is not what your parents believed. It's, it's not even what you confessed as a child or a prayer that you may have prayed 20 years ago. What matters is what you believe today. Is your faith living and active today? That's the only thing I can give you any assurance from Scripture about. What is your confession of faith today? And does it show evidence in your life? Okay, are you standing firm. So this is our big idea today from our text. What you believe today matters the most. All right, the author of Hebrews is reminding the struggling group of Christians that the most important day in their spiritual journey is when? Today. And that's true for us too. So let's pray as we dive into this. Lord, we do give you thanks for uh, the faithful people over the years in our lives who have, have shared the gospel with us, who've taught us the word, who have loved us and pointed us to you. We're, we're grateful, Lord, for those memories. We're grateful for the experiences. And some of us uh, remember those days when we were in darkness and we came into the light and we remember that with fondness and gratitude. But Lord, we also are reminded today that what matters is what we believe today. So open our eyes, uh, help us to evaluate and even see um, our lives today from your perspective. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So Hebrews 3, uh, remember this letter is really a written sermon Okay, from a concerned pastor who was away from, from the local church that he was writing. And that local church was under pressure. It was facing persecution. Uh, these believers were former Jews, okay, and they were tempted under this pressure they were in to, to dial back their faith in Jesus, to maybe compromise their confession, to maybe go back to some things that they knew and that brought them comfort in days past. And here's what the pastor is telling them. Don't drift. Don't neglect. Don't ignore the great salvation that we have in Jesus. So this is a timely message, a reminder for us today to pay much closer attention because we are under pressure too in our culture. So to stand firm under pressure, first thing we see in the text here is we must keep Jesus at the core of our confession. Okay, chapter 2 last week was about our heavenly calling, who are we, how, how you were made for glory, how Jesus actually suffered to restore you to glory, and how Jesus is here to help you get to glory. So now in chapter 3, we see that Jesus must be first the center. 
He needs to be the center. So let's start Hebrews 3, 1 to 4. Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Okay, so here we see Jesus is called the apostle, which simply means the sent one, the founder, the high priest of our confession. We're going to see in, in Hebrews 12, uh, this admonition to let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to who? Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. So if you met someone who knew nothing about Christianity, and they asked you, well, what do you believe? What is the first thing you should tell them about? Jesus. If you don't understand who he is uh, and what he has done for me, if you don't understand my complete allegiance and dependence on him, you won't understand my faith. See, it's not about going to church. It's not about being good. It's not about being baptized. It's not about anything else related to religion. See, our confession is all about Jesus. Now, why is the preacher telling them this? Consider Jesus. Well, these listeners, for these listeners, there was some competition. Moses, all right? Remember, they were Jews. So secondly, Jesus must be the priority. As former Jews, they, they had some spiritual baggage. In chapter 1, that baggage was angels. But uh, as former Jews, they had an even higher view of Moses than they did of angels. So let's continue reading here, uh, starting in verse 5. Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were being spoken later. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son. And we talked about this in chapter 1. All of us, all of us have some kind of spiritual baggage. We may not even be fully aware of it. But when the heat is on, uh, we tend to lean on those things from our past that brought us some level of comfort or assurance. But this religious baggage can actually be a serious hindrance in your spiritual journey, especially when it competes with Jesus. So do you know what your spiritual baggage is? Have you thought about it? Have you uh, evaluated your life? I mean, for these believers, it was Moses, it was angels, and some other things that we're going to get to later. But the sermon he's preaching here in Hebrews 3 is, consider Jesus. He must be the center. He must be the priority. And then third, this, he must be the confidence. Verse 6, but Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house. If indeed we hold fast our confidence and are boasting in our hope. Okay, so Jesus is leading the way home but we must cling to him. We must hold on to him firmly. Verse 14 says this, firm to the end. Now, what does he mean boasting? Boasting here simply means, hey, this is what we declare boldly to others. Our hope is in Jesus, unashamedly. Now, why is the preacher so concerned about them holding fast. Don't let go. 
Because what you believe today matters the most. Christians were hated in Rome, not because they worshiped Jesus, but because they worshiped Jesus only. All right. Who did Romans worship? Well, many gods, but first and foremost, they worshiped who? Caesar, the emperor. All right. and, and so the people blamed Christians for their problems because they believed that community worship of the gods and of the emperor brought blessing. And if there were people in their community who failed to do that, well, trouble would come. So when someone was accused of being a Christian, a follower of Jesus, um, in times when persecutions broke out, they would be confronted with making a confession. If they confessed Jesus as Lord and would not worship the emperor, they could be killed. But if they wanted, they could actually recant their confession. Oh, yeah, you know what? I don't believe that anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll worship the emperor. Glad to. And they would be allowed to live. This was a day of testing for their faith. You know, would they hold fast to the confession of Jesus? I mean, public confession of Jesus is actually a strong evidence of our salvation. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, it has to be there, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So the people who got this letter were facing this trial of making this confession and possibly dying for it. That doesn't happen here, but that actually happens somewhere in the world today. Someone in the world today is going to die for making this confession of faith. Hard to imagine it. We don't face that, but we do face temptations to dial it back, to not speak with confidence uh, because it's going to ruffle some feathers. I don't think this is going to be a very receptive audience. I just kind of want to fit in. And every time we do that, here's what happens. We drift further away. Uh, it's very serious. So, the preacher tells them this, to stand firm under pressure, secondly, we must take care not to fall away from our confession. And the preacher uses an example from the Old Testament to warn them. He's actually quoting Psalm 95, which King David wrote, but he was reflecting, David was reflecting on even earlier events from 500 years previous to him that took place in the book of Numbers when the Israelites were delivered from Egypt and they were headed to the promised land. Look at verse 7. I love, it says this, Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, who wrote Psalm 95? I just said it. David. David wrote the psalm, but we believe the Bible is the word of God spoken through men. That's why when we read the Bible, you know, Paul may have written the, the letter to the church of, of the Romans, but when we read it, what do we say? God says in his word. So let's read this warning from Psalm 95, starting in verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. So there's some warnings here, several things that we need to be careful about. First is this, not listening. Be careful 
about not listening today if you hear his voice. Okay, that, that's actually the call to worship in a Jewish synagogue. Um, if you went to a Jewish worship service, this is what they would say every time. And it's, it's meant as a warning. Um, because when we, we stop listening, when we stop hearing God's voice, we drift. So when was the last time you seriously read the Bible? Not just here and there, every once in a while, but I mean, you read it like your life depended on it. Now, it's great if you read it in the past. Oh, yeah, there was a season I read through the Bible. I was really into it. Um, the warning here is about listening when? Today. Are you hearing his voice today? Or are you trying to live off the gleanings from years past, memories of Sunday school, times when, when you pursued God with, with more vigor. The warning here is be careful because hearing His voice today is critical to avoid the next thing we need to be careful of. Secondly, is a hardened heart. Verse 8 and even verse 13 says, the heart is hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So a hard heart doesn't usually show up when, when life is going well. But it does show up in the day of testing. And uh, the story, again, that he's referring to here was in Numbers 13 and 14. If you remember, the Israelites had left Egypt. Uh, they saw God do all kinds of amazing miracles to save them, to care for them. And now they were on the edge of the promised land. I mean, they're almost there. And what did they do? They sent some spies into the land. Um, when they got back, the report started great. Oh, the land is amazing. Here's the grapes to prove it. But then came the testing. Yeah, but there's walled cities there's giants who live there. There's no way we can conquer it. So it's kind of like this with, with kids, but even with adults. As long as we get everything we want, um, you can't really see our hard hearts. Uh, but when, as soon as someone says no to us, or when things start getting hard, that's when we discover our true heart condition. This is the test of a friendship. You know, if all's going well, no problem. It's the test of a marriage. Um, it's the test of your political support. It's not when everything is good. It's when the testing comes. How is your heart? You've heard me say this before. What happens when your cup gets bumped? That, that's when you discover what was in your cup. It spills out because I got bumped. Um, times of testing are when we really see what's in our cup. And three more things that showed up that can lead us to fall astray, and he tells us to be careful of. Third thing is this, unbelief. Verse 9, <clears throat> the Israelites saw what God did to deliver them, but they would not believe that God could bring them into the land. So, unbelief actually shows up in fear, fear of the giants, fear of the difficulties. So, what, what is the opposite of fear? We, we might think courage, but it's actually not. It's trust. It's, it's faith. Uh, Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And the consequences of this unbelief for Israel were huge. Look at verse 19. So we see that they were unable to enter because of what? Unbelief. Everyone over the age of 20, except Caleb and Joshua, would die in the wilderness uh, over the next 40 years of wandering around in the desert. They would miss getting to go into the land. What are we missing 
in life because of fear, because of unbelief. And unbelief, actually, it shows itself in the next thing that we're to be careful about, the fourth thing, grumbling. Now, we don't see it in Psalm 95. We don't read it actually here in Hebrews. But if, if you know the story and you go to Numbers, what you'll see is it's full of grumbling and complaining. Let's go back to Egypt. Let's choose a new leader. Look what uh, the Lord said to Moses in Numbers 14. The Lord said to Moses, I don't believe you, God. The consequences to that are serious. So, listen, our culture loves to grumble. I mean, just read Twitter and Facebook. Lots of grumbling going on. It's just become normalized in our culture. Are you part of it? Are you grumbling? Are you complaining to others on social media? Be careful. Take care um, not to fall away. Grumbling. This is what it does. It damages our heart. It's, it's a sign, of, actually, of unbelief in God. It, it leads to another danger. It's the fifth thing here he says to be careful of, and that's disobedience. Look at verse 10. It says, they provoked God. Who provoked God? The Israelites. How did they do it? Through disobedience, they refused to follow him and go, ah, oh, they're so disobedient. I can't believe they were afraid to go in after all that God had done for them, that they rebelled. I wouldn't have done that. You know? They saw the power of God, and then they just turned their backs on him. I would have gone in. I would have trusted God to conquer those giants. Easy to pick on the Hebrews. They messed up a lot. But the preacher is not telling them this story to show them how bad the Jews were. He's warning them. Don't fall into the same trap. Because we do. He's saying, you're not better than them. So be careful. Look at verse 12. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. You can just hear the preacher. He's just like, take care to not fall away. I mean, Paul, the Apostle Paul, tells the church in Corinth uh, a similar thing, that these stories uh, in the Old Testament were actually written down for us us as warning. So it's a lot of text, but I think it's important for us to read this. This is what he tells the church in Corinth. I, I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud. They all passed through the sea, okay, you know, with Moses. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food, the, the manna. They drank the same spiritual drink, they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them because of their unbelief, their disobedience, their grumbling, their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, these things occurred, why? As examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. He goes on. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. You remember at the base of Mount Sinai, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did were killed by the destroying angel. Why did all that stuff happen? These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for who? Us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. So, if you think you're standing firm, what does he say? Be careful that you don't fall. See, we, we can just so easily deceive ourselves into thinking we're okay. I'm standing firm. 
I'll be okay. But when we don't take care, when we stop paying attention, that's when we fall. Um, that's when we fall. Don't be like those Hebrews. What matters is your spiritual condition today. Today. So fix your eyes on Jesus. Take the warning seriously. And then finally, he gives us the remedy in some ways for falling away. It's right here. It's the third thing. He says, exhort one another to hold firm our confession. And he tells us to do three simple things, but they're not easy things. First is this. Take seriously a personal responsibility. We've already read it, but let's look again at verse 12. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to falling away from the living God. So to take care, it, it's to be intentional. It's to have a plan. It's to be on your guard because you know that your situation is fragile or it's under threat. So he's, he's telling them, take care. Take responsibility for your heart. Um, Proverbs 4.23 says this, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. If you think you're standing firm, be careful. That, that would never happen to me. See, that's when we're vulnerable. We let our guard down. And when we let our guard down, evil is lurking. It gets in our heart and leads us away from the living God. And then all of a sudden we find ourselves going, how did I get here? How did I end up in this place? Here's how. One step at a time. There's no getting away from taking personal responsibility for our hearts, but we should not and we cannot do it alone. So we need to take seriously the second thing, which is a community responsibility. We need to exhort one another. Look at verse 13. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Okay? The Bible is full of commands about how we in the church are to be a protection for one another. You know, in, it's kind of like in, in an Amish barn raising. Uh, have you ever seen how that happens? Uh, the entire community gathers and works together to build a huge barn, like in one day. Now, see, the farmer could never do it alone, so they helped one another. You cannot stand up and stand firm under pressure alone. The journey is too dangerous. And really, it's, it's impossible alone. So we're told uh, to all do our part to build up the body of Christ. And, and we're going to read this later in Hebrews 10, one of my favorite verses here. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Okay, so you're here. We're, we're doing this. We, we do this every Sunday. But it's not enough. All right, that's why I encourage you. Men, come to the men's breakfast. Uh, join a small group. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's a group that prays at 9 a.m. Just come early to church and gather for prayer with some others. Meet a Christian friend for coffee. It doesn't have to be part of the church program. Share what you're reading in the Bible. Pray for one another. Encourage one another. How often do we need to be exhorting one another? What does it say right there in the text in verse 13? How often? Every day. <laughs> Why every day? I mean... That's a lot, God. Why do we need to do this every day? Well, we're a bigger piece of work than we ever imagined. You know. But also for this reason. Because what you believe, what matters is what you believe today. Today. If you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. And here's the reality. We don't see what we don't see. We're just so good at deceiving ourselves into thinking that we're standing firm. We need others in our lives who love us enough 
to spur us on, to agitate us a bit, to stir up our lives, um, and to say, what are you doing? So, what are you doing about this? I'm exhorting you right now. Invite other people into your journey. Do not do this alone. Um, even if you think you're standing firm, you're really in a dangerous spot. Let us help you build the barn. It's the only way that we're going to stand firm under pressure. And finally, we need, there's a third thing. We need to take seriously a permanent responsibility. The preacher here says, hold firm to the end. Look at verses 14. For we have come to share in Christ. If indeed we hold our original confidence firm to what? To the end. As it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Uh, w recently we were using the illustration of rappelling down a cliff. You know, rock climbing and you get to the top and, and then you're hanging onto the rope and you're rappelling down. Uh, when you're rappelling down a cliff, when can you let go of the rope? Not till you get to the bottom. <laughs> you better not let go, not before. It won't end well. His rest still stands. Let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. So fear. Um, the fear of, of falling down the cliff keeps my grip on that rope firm. Is that a bad thing? That's a good thing. <laughs> um, there's a healthy fear of our own weakness and vulnerability that should actually help us keep our grip, um, our hold on our confession, on our confidence in Christ, our need for others to exhort one another in love. So, hey, if the Boy Scouts can say that oath with one another, you know, if our, if our country can encourage and promote this daily reciting of a pledge of allegiance to students, I mean, is it too much to ask that we as followers of Christ commit, pledge ourselves to what we know is of eternal value? Is that too much to ask? No. So let's hang on to Jesus. Let's stand firm together. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, let's, let's pray together. Well, God, thank you for your word. Thanks for these reminders that were written down for us as examples so that we wouldn't fall into the same traps out of thinking that we're standing firm or we're not. So Lord, we commit ourselves with all vigilance to guard our hearts, to invite others into our journey. Lord, we cannot do this alone. Thank you for the church. Thank you for others that we can exhort one another every day to stand firm, to hold tight, and to keep going. So God, that's what we do. We thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your truth. We ask you to help us to follow you, to trust you. In Jesus' name.